be careful. Uh, uh, Psalm 14, uh, verse 1 through 7, if you uh, need an outline, uh, there's one in your bulletin, and then uh, Dick will hand out another one if you like a worksheet. You might notice I got red, white, and blue on here, and I know it's a little warm in here, so I'm taking the, one of the blues off. Uh, so I've now, now I've still got, well, I got blue paint, so I'm still okay. I look pretty patriotic today. And, uh, got the right colors on today, don't I, dear? And uh, Psalm 14, Psalm 14, I'm going to start reading this in verse number one. The fool hath said in his heart, uh, there is no God. They are corrupt. They've done abominable works. There's none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven on the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all, they are to all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? It's a good question. Who eat up my people as bread and call not upon the Lord? Uh, there were they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of God were come out of Zion. When the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. Psalm 14, great psalm. And uh, I have a message entitled, The Salvation of the Lord is Coming. And, uh, and uh, we can see the corruption of mankind spoken about as well, but we see the victory of the Lord in the end. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you for your grace allowing us to be here tonight. I pray you'll uh, loosen my stammering tongue, allow me to speak with great clarity and uh, speak in such a way that God's people can hear and understand and uh, Lord, I pray that uh, you will bless your word. I may accomplish uh, the purpose for which it was written and accomplish that purpose in the lives of those that are here and those that are listening. And we ask this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, every part of the word of God is given to us for a purpose. And uh, when we read, we should be seeing and considering what is God trying to tell me today? What is this all about? This isn't just a history book. It's a it's the living word that God gives to his children, and it's for us. Some of it uh, gets a little mundane, but it's educational. We're still learning. We're still learning, and, the, and it's good to learn everything. Now, we're learning some things here about the salvation of the Lord is coming, and it's also talking about the lost here. And uh, it uh, describes uh, those that are without God as fools. And uh, uh, Psalm 14, verse 1, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. And uh, so here we are with this thought here about the fool. And, uh, and the, uh, we notice where he's saying this. He says, says in his heart, there is no God. Now, uh, friends, we'll have a lot of people say there is a God, but in their heart they say there is not a God. Uh, uh, friend, uh, if you're talking to a person that's deep in sin and they're practicing things that are clearly against God and God's word, uh, they might say to you, yes, they believe there's a God, but they don't really believe there's a God or they wouldn't be doing that stuff. Uh, and uh, they're really saying in their heart, uh, there is no God because they're going to follow whatever their heart leads them to, not what God leads them to do. Uh, and they say there is no God and uh, their confession here, uh, there is no God. That word confession means their profession. They're, they're speaking this out and, uh, and they said there is no God and their profession is found in their life. Uh, uh, their confession is, what do you do with it? If, if God, uh, and we see if, if God is really real and he's in your heart, it's going to have an impact upon your life, isn't he? But they say in their heart, there is no God. And uh, they're right, uh, because without salvation, God is not in their heart. Uh, uh, God is in this world, and God is in the hearts of those that believe in him and love him and are saved. But uh, there's a void in their heart until Jesus comes in. Amen. And, uh, and uh, so they're without discerning, they're, they're, they're without understanding, and there's no concept. They're dull, They've, their senses are dull in their heart, and the, because God is not in their heart that's, uh, that's uh, influencing them. Now think about this as we're going through this, because this is, some of this is going to be dealing with the thought of well, what happens to an individual that God is not in the heart, and the influence of God is not there. Did, did it make a difference when you got saved, how you thought about things? 
Does it make a difference in how you think about things? Well, a lost person doesn't have that that uh, God in the heart. Uh, so because God's not in the heart now, uh, their whole perspective has changed. Uh, they're, uh, they don't understand. So their confession, the, and notice the description, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And I want to say this right out. A, a person is a fool not to have God in their heart. Uh, and because he's readily available and willing to come in. And uh, someone said, uh, well, you've got to give God your heart. Well, what you've got to do is open your heart and let him come in and change your heart. Uh, your old heart's no good. He wants to give you a new heart. He wants to change you. And their corruption, we see uh, as well. He said, uh, there is no God. They are corrupt and have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. So as we see the corruption that comes with the absence of God in the heart. When God is not in the heart, then corruption comes into that person's life. And it's manifested itself in abominable works. Look what it says. He says, they are corrupt. They've done abominable works. Titus chapter 1, verse 16 says it like this. They profess that they know God, but in works they denying, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. And Titus is talking about someone who says they know God, but God's not really in their heart. And because of that, they're doing these corrupt, abominable works. And they do them because God's not really in their heart. Uh, they've got a little bit of a head knowledge, but not a, not a heart knowledge. Uh, you know, you can have a head knowledge of, of God, but a head knowledge is not the same as a heart knowledge. Uh, and we can all testify to that. Amen. If you love someone, that changes uh, your whole uh, attitude and, and uh, your whole perspective of the way you, you treat someone. Uh, I, I know that we've got a daughter named Jenny. We love Jenny. Uh, we don't care that she's got Downs. She's in our heart. And you know, some people that don't have uh, Jenny in their heart, they don't know, well, you should just do this or that. Well, that's okay for you to say, but he's not in your heart. He's in our heart. And when someone's in our heart, that affects our attitude, actions towards other people. Amen. And friend, when a person gets married, I, it's the hope that uh, their two hearts become united in Christ and then they have each other in their heart and then they're, they're sympathetic towards one another. It's not all about them all the time. Someone said the best marriage is when you think more about your mate than, they, than you think about yourself. Uh, and if they're in your heart, that's the way it ought to work. Amen. Uh, and that's the way it is in a lot of good homes, good hearts. And so their corruption, they've done abominable works. And if you've got uh, uh, a, uh, a corrupt heart, it's going to manifest itself in your works and what you do. And someone said, I don't know why they do that. They're, they're just following their heart's desire. They're following their heart. When a lost person is doing these stupid things, that's where their heart has led them because they're lost and they're doing what lost people do. Yeah, and, uh, and their condemnation is universal. Again, verse 1, they are corrupt. They've done abominable works. There's none that doeth good. So there's that universal condemnation. And, and the universal condemnation of those people without God, it says, there is none that doeth good. That's a, that's a universal uh, condemnation. There's none that doeth good. Now, catch me or follow me when I'm saying this. Uh, good comes, uh, uh, let me just say it like this. When a lost person does something that you might categorize as good, there still is no reward because God is not in their heart. Uh, the, uh, hell doesn't have a uh, paradise portion of hell where the where the sinners go that were kind of nice to some Christians. There's no, that's not there. Hell is a place of suffering because nothing they've done is good. Because unless God is in their heart, their heart is corrupt. It's corrupt. Now, what does it mean? What do you want to say that? What does it mean? Well, uh, a lost person, a lost person could do things that are good, but because God is not in their heart, uh, um, what they have done is is probably going to be motivated by corrupt uh, 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 desires and actions and, and thinking. There's a word that we talk about in the scripture. It's called uh, iniquity. I've got a sermon over here. It's been waiting for me to preach. It's, uh, I should bring it over here to preach it tonight. And it's on that subject of iniquity. Uh, some people don't know what iniquity is. Uh, most Christians don't really consider the concept of what iniquity is. Iniquity is not measured by the works that you do. 
it's 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 defined by your motivation or the reason that you do it. And more precisely, in the case right here, if God is not in the heart, there's nothing we can do that's not iniquity. Uh, it's never going to measure up because we're not right with Him. I can might say it like this: No matter what we do, if we're not right with Him, it's going to be wrong. You say, well, it was right. Well, it might have been right in the general sense of here and to your neighbor, but it's not still not right because you're still lost. You still have missed the mark. Let me just say it like this. Uh, religious, religious people oftentimes commit iniquity on a regular basis. They do good things and because they want to do those good works to salve their lost conscience, and they're not saved. Then those good works are iniquity, and that iniquity uh, is still in their hearts. Uh, they won't be rewarded for it. Why? Because they were trusting in their own self-righteousness. And you see, that's the thing about iniquity, and that's the, that's the, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, they're corrupt, they've done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Romans 3, verse 10 says this, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone uh, uh, out of the way. They are all together become, um, become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And all that is talking about, again, is that those uh, uh, when a person is without God and God is not in their heart, that corruption, that iniquity means that they, they can't do good. They can't do something that God will uh, ultimately reward them with in heaven. Now, I'm not saying God might not be nice to them here on earth if they do, if if they uh, if they give a drink to a brother uh, or a sister that's in need, they might get a small reward, but it's not going to be a heavenly reward. Uh, they're still corrupt. They're still corrupt. They're still lost. And uh, uh, and uh, so uh, the Egyptians. Uh, 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 the thought there about the Egyptians uh, would not eat with the Jews. And, uh, and yet uh, we would say, well, the Egyptians in some cases were good to the Jews. No. Uh, God took them out of that land of Egypt, didn't he, and set them free. Now, so the condemnation is universal. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. A fool who does not have God in his heart he is corrupt, and he's done abominable works, and there's none that doeth good. And now, verse 2, God, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. So now we, here's the second thought. He, now he says, okay, they've got uh, the lost have this inherent uh, sinfulness because God's not in their heart. And now he's going further in their condemnation. And God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any did understand and seek God. Now, what I just said to you, how many lost people get that? How many lost people get what I just said? That they got to be saved to be right with God. You see, so many lost people th still think they can earn their way to heaven. That God is going to just be a merciful God. He's going to forgive everybody and forget everything. And, and because they've defined that, that's who God is. God is good. And because God is good, uh, yeah, just uh, he's just going to be good to everybody. They don't have to be saved. But they forget the fact that they're they're condemned because they're doing abominable works. They're not saved. And so the Lord looked down under B and see if any did understand. And he looked down and did that search. He did search and he did that search. And he searched and he found uh, uh, that uh, uh, there was no one. And look at verse 3. And he said, there was no one. And, and no one here, it doesn't say the word no one, but look what it says. They are all gone aside. Uh, now, uh, by going aside, that would be to miss the mark, wouldn't it? That would be like, okay, there's the, there's the thing you're aiming at, doing good, pleasing God, but they miss the mark. They miss it to the left, they miss it to the right, they miss it above it, they miss it below it. And, and the, the reality is, is why the, the fools are evil and, uh, and they're corrupt. It's because they don't, they don't know God. And as he says there in verse number three, he's looked on the children and said, any did understand. They don't understand. 
and they don't seek God and they are gone aside, they've missed the mark. And uh, I'll tell you something, lost people miss the mark. They could be, you know, here's the sad thing. They could be nicer than a backslidden Christian, but a backslidden Christian is so better than a, than a, than a lost person that's never been saved. Their, their only goodness rests upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the law sometimes will look at uh, backslidden Christians and use that to salve their own conscience for their own godliness. But listen, uh, uh, they are gone aside. They've strayed. They've missed the mark. Someone said that uh, what it means to miss the mark. Uh, so if I've got a bow and an arrow here and there's a star in the entranceway on that and I aim that and I, and I don't hit it. Do you know something? Here's the thought. The arrow hit something. The arrow hit something. It didn't hit the perfect thing, but it hit something else. And the arrow always comes up short of perfection. And uh, so if we're always coming up short, we want to be judged by our works. Well, all your works come up short. They didn't hit the mark. They still missed. They came up short of the glory of God. Because in the end, God didn't glory. You did it for the, your own glory. And, and you're not God. And so they've gone aside. They've gone aside. They meaning they've missed the mark. They are all together become filthy. They're all dirty. So first they've missed the mark. Second, they're all together become filthy. That, and what does it mean to be filthy? Just plain dirty. The dirtiness of sin. Sin makes them dirty. What shall wash away my sin? Well, there's no washing away if you don't get saved. And so the lost are dirty. Why? Because the sins haven't been washed away. You know, the forgiveness you get when you're saved and the washing away, uh, uh, I don't think Christians appreciate that. You've been made clean. You've been washed up. You've been washed up. You're not as you once were. The filth is gone. I want to tell you, I've, I've dealt with Christians that can't forgive themselves. Well, God doesn't ask you to forgive yourself. He tells you he'll forgive you. He'll wash it away. He'll wash it away. There's nothing wrong with us feeling guilty for things we've done wrong in the past. But we ought to understand something. It's under the blood. We can use it as a teaching tool to make sure we never do it again. But we'll never be held accountable for it. Because our sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're no longer filthy. And then he goes on. He says, so they are all. And here in verse 3, we see the word all three times. Notice in verse 3, three times. All gone aside. All filthy. And uh, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. Well, I guess there's only two there, isn't there? But the thought, the thought there is that is that we're, we're the lost are just that. They're lost. They are all together become filthy. But on the flip side of that, the saved are all okay. They're all good. Now Psalm 51 verse 1 says this. Uh, uh, David's uh, crying out in prayer. Now here's the problem. See, you and I as Christians, we could be uh, what we would call saved and still have problems with sin. Now, when we have a problem with sin, what should we do? Well, we need to confess it, don't we? We need to ask God to forgive it because our fellowship here on earth is broken. We still have a, a, a God that loves us. I may put it like this. I've got, I've got four children. My, my four children, because uh, they've been born of my wife and myself, we have a living relationship through birth. You have a relationship with God through birth, too. And because you've been birthed by Jesus Christ, your relationship to God is not going to be severed. It's, it's, it's eternal, isn't it? Our relationship with our children is not going to be severed because we've been, they were born into our family. They're born of us. Now, do they miss the mark sometimes? Yes, they do. Our kids miss the mark sometimes, don't they? Do our kids uh, uh, do things they shouldn't do sometimes? They do. Do we, do we chase them? Do we deal with them? But you know something? Our relationship doesn't change. They're, they're still our children. And, uh, and so while the lost have no relationship, we have a relationship. And when David cries out in Psalm 51, 
He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of my thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. You see, this is a, this is a prayer of a child of God. This is not a prayer of a lost person excusing his sin. This is the prayer of a saved child of God confessing his sin. And by the way, if you're a saved child of God and you want to confess your sin, you better stop excusing your sin and start confessing your sin and asking God for forgiveness and, and to cleanse you. And so the saved person cries out and says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before thee, against thee and thee only have I sinned, and done evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity. Now he goes back to his life before salvation. In sin my mother did conceive me, and behold, thou desirest uh, truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make known uh, to known wisdom. And you see, he was... Uh, uh, well, we don't understand just exactly that Old Testament revelation. We know that when we're born again, we become part of the family. Amen? And verse 3b says this, uh, they are all together gone aside. They're all together become filthy. <coughs> and then we also see there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Those are all true. Now, a C, the lost, then have no true knowledge of God. Look at verse 4. Have all the workers of iniquity no, no uh, knowledge who eat up my people uh, as they eat up bread and call not upon the Lord? So all of those people that are workers of iniquity, these are people that work iniquity. Now, iniquity is not defined by the nature of the work. It's defined by the fact that it's done by polluted people it's going to come up short. It's never perfect because it's not done in unison. And, and a matter of fact, works of iniquity can be done for the wrong motivation. I'll be nice to you so you can be nice to me. No, that's the wrong motivation. That's a selfish motivation. If you're nice to your fellow workers, so they'll be nice to you. Well, you should be nice to them even if they're not nice to you. Right? We shouldn't have that sort of uh, uh, iniquity where we're doing things to get I'm going to be nice to mom so she gets me something. You know, I, I should be nice to mom because I love her. Amen. And, and uh, 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 they are all gone aside. They're all to come filthy. That's the loss. But we, uh, and now he says this in verse 4, have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge. Don't they understand this? Don't the lost understand this? That they can't bribe God with good works? If you could bribe God with good works, then Jesus wouldn't have had to go to Calvary. Right? We could earn our salvation. Matter of fact, if iniquity ever satisfied a holy God, then Christ would not have had to die for our sins on Calvary. It would not need to have been that life given, uh, the pure life, the pure blood of Jesus Christ. And so he asked that question. He said, have all the workers of iniquity no, had no knowledge, meaning no knowledge of God, they don't understand that that God is not satisfied with pretense. Uh, and those people who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord, don't they all, all understand something that, that, uh, that God's not going to be merciful to them if they do that? Matter of fact, it says in verse 5, they'll be in great fear. Uh, don't the iniquities, uh, workers of iniquity have no knowledge that God knows the motivations of the heart? Don't they understand that, go, that, uh, that if they eat up God's people as they eat up bread and call not upon the Lord, that God is going to judge them, that, that, uh, that, that uh, uh, they, they should be in great fear because God is going to judge them someday? And so we have the workers of iniquity. They outwardly appear righteous. Matthew chapter uh, uh, 23, verse 28 says this, the workers of iniquity... Even so also uh, outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And so uh, the people that are great filled with iniquity, uh, they could fool people, they could fool pastors, they could fool you. 
because you assume that they're that they're that they're that they're right because they're doing these good works. I might just say it like this: Isn't it wonderful when people come to church on a regular basis? But if people come to church and they're lost and they know they're lost and they're not really saved, but they're coming and uh, because they think this is somehow going to earn favor with God, what they did in coming was really an iniquity. And don't they understand that, that uh, those workers of iniquity, don't they know that God knows the difference? Don't they understand that as they eat up uh, God's people as bread that, uh, and call not upon the name of the Lord that God knows that? Romans chapter uh, 3 says this. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith them that are under the law. Now, friend, if you're not saved, if a person's not saved, that's what they're under. They're under the law. Because you can either be under Christ through salvation, and God will treat you as, a, as being under the law. The, uh, the Old Testament law came, the Israel was under the law, wasn't it? And then grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen. Grace is not based upon the law. It's based upon the gracious gift of God, his son who died for us on Calvary for our sins. Okay. So it says, now we know that the things whatsoever the law saith, Romans 3.19, it saith them that are under the law, that's the, the lost, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be, we become guilty before God. So all the law is coming and so the, law, the, the people that are doing these good works, they'll one day stand before God, but they're going to be, be proclaimed guilty because the law is going to condemn them. But we're not under the law if we're saved. We're in Christ. And so uh, 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 the, the law will be against them. Verse 20, Therefore by deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, and that's why the law was given. The law was given to convict people they were sinners in need of a Savior. It was not given to justify people. The policeman doesn't pull you over and say, I just uh, want to give you a ticket. Uh, you could take it to Hardee's, and they'll give you a free meal. They give you a ticket. It's not a, it's not a reward. It's a penalty. The, they, they ignore you unless you break the law. And the law is given to deal with lawbreakers. It's not given to deal with, uh, with uh, uh, people that don't break the law. It's given to lawbreakers. But now the righteousness uh, of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The righteousness, meaning that they're not guilty. The, the righteousness of God is being manifest. And this is what the law was pointing to. This is what the prophets were preaching about. The law was given to give people a knowledge of sin, so they'd want to ask God to save them. And, and, and plead and say, God, I'm a sinner, please save me. But now righteousness without the law of God is manifested. That's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that was displayed by himself. And, and the, righteous, or the righteous one was died on Calvary for our sins. And then he goes on and says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them believe, for there is no difference, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God, be justified freely by the grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Through the redemption of, of God, through Christ Jesus, his righteousness is imputed to us. What a wonderful deal that is. For God has set him forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. The word propitiation is a big word, isn't it? It simply means the satisfaction. It means satisfaction. It's the payment made that satisfied a holy God. His, his blood satisfied a holy God. We have, our sins have been, uh, in the eyes of God, our sin has been paid for. The debt's been paid by Jesus. And if the debt hadn't been paid, he couldn't have been raised. Someone said, why was he in the grave three days? Because in three days... He did the propiti work of propitiation. And in three days, God was satisfied and raised him from the dead. Yeah. Three days. Three days in the, in the ground. Uh, he rose in the third, but it's called three days in the scripture. Three days. There's a couple of verses that refer to it as that. And it's parts of, 
uh, uh, parts of three different days. It's kind of interesting when you look at that, uh, how long he spent, uh, he spent in the grave, but in the scripture he makes that reference to three days. So being justified freely by his grace through the redemption sin Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through the faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins, that's forgiveness of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, that's the grace of God, forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, now this is really regarding Jesus, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Now, that he, that is God, might be just. Now, I'll just say it like this. If, uh, if somebody uh, committed a terrible sin against you, your family, if somebody murdered your dog, that'd be pretty bad. If somebody murdered or, or did something terrible to you, robbed or stole from you, and it, it really affected you, it affected your life, and broke your heart. And, and if that, uh, that person one day, uh, to your surprise, you, you, they, they're in heaven. And, uh, and they never they never repented of their sin. They never turned from their sin. They never their sin has never been dealt with. They're still you could say every time you look at him, you see that you could see it. You could see it, and you you would hate him. But you know something, I've been washed in the blood. And uh, those people that see me in heaven won't see me as I once was. They won't see that filth in the mire of the old man. It'll all be washed away. We're all new creatures in Christ. We're new creation. That he is the, might be the just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And that's what it means. Uh, he declares us through the forbearance of God right. And it, it cost Christ his blood. It cost him his life. He died for us. But what about the wicked? Well, they don't call upon the Lord. Verse 4, have they no knowledge who eat of my people and call not upon the Lord? See, that's the end of verse 4. That's the problem with the lost. They don't call. We have a verse, whosoever shall what? Call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you've never called, if you never called, if you've never called, you're still under that, under that curse of sin. And, and we, have to be, we have to be saved. We have to be saved and we have to call upon the name of the Lord for salvation and God by his grace saves us and cha Romans chapter 3 verse 33 it says as it is written behold I shall lay in Zion a stumbling stone a rock of offense and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed you see whosoever believes in Jesus will never be ashamed never be disappointed if you're ever witnessing to someone you can tell show them that verse and say listen if you believe in Jesus you'll never be disappointed you ever said that to someone? I have, but I've dealt with them. And I'll say to them, listen, if you ask Jesus to save you, I'm going to make you a promise you'll never, ever, ever be disappointed. I've said, I've said that to people. I've said to that in all my years in the ministry and all the times I've been preaching, I've never met a single person that's ever regretted getting saved. I've met many, many Christians that regretted not getting saved sooner. But I've never met a Christian that ever regrets being saved. It's like a money back guarantee. As you could say, anybody, anybody, anybody that calls upon the name of the Lord and gets saved is ever, 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 ever going to regret it. Now, we all know that uh, one of the chief problems of sin is, uh, is the guilt and the regrets afterwards. And those guilts and all those things will not go away until they get saved. Someone said it's hard to deal sometimes with people when they've committed a terrible sin because they can't forgive themselves. But uh, we have to show them that uh, it's not about you, it's about God, just to let you know you might not forgive yourself, but I know God's forgiven you. And we need to let them know that. Romans 10 uh, 11, Scripture saying, Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed, and meaning you'll ever be disappointed. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, though the same Lord is the rich and all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that verse there kind of lumps them together and said, There's not going to be any Jews that are ever going to regret it. There's not going to be Gentiles that ever regret it. Anybody that asks God to save, they're never, ever, ever, ever going to regret it. By the way, anybody here regret getting saved? No. Never met a single person. Never will. 
I've met people got I've had people get saved literally on their deathbed. You know something? They never regretted it. And the lost, they live in great fear. Verse 5, for they were in great fear, for God is, uh, is in the generation of the righteous. And you know something, uh, this is something we don't quite understand, but oftentimes the lost are, uh, live in fear of people that are saved. Ever wonder why that uh, for some people there's a visceral hatred and anger against Christianity? Fear. They're afraid of Christians. They're afraid that the Christians are right and, and they're wrong. And uh, they were in great fear. And I think sometimes uh, you look at uh, the experience that uh, 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 the different individuals in, that went through in the scripture. You look at uh, uh, David. Uh, you, you look at uh, Joshua. You look at some of these great uh, uh, leaders in the Old Testament. And the leaders were, uh, got where they were actually afraid of them. Saul was afraid of David. Why? Because Saul was wicked and David was righteous. And there's a fear that takes place. And uh, the lost uh, live in fear. And they live in fear because they're afraid of the righteous. For they know that God is in the generation of the righteous. And that uh, for they know God is going to bless those people. Now, friend, I'll tell you something. If you, if you, uh, and this is, this is a funny thing. I don't understand quite how this works. But if you start living for God and you really live for God, try to live for God at the workplace, you're going to have some people that are going to be angry with you. And the real reason they're angry with you is not because they're, they're, they're mad at you. It's because they fear you. They fear your testimony. They fear it's convicting on themselves. And they know they're not right with God. Uh, verse 6, uh, Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor because the Lord is his refuge. Uh, and so now he's talking about this. Uh, they were in great fear. And I think in verse 6, it's still talking about they that were in fear for God is in the generation of the righteous. It's, Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor. Uh, they shame the counsel of the poor because the Lord is his refuge. And I say, yet uh, that's the loss. They know God is the, re is the refuge of the saved. And because he knows it's the refuge of those that are poor, uh, uh, they 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 uh, they live in that fear. They live in that fear. Now the hope of the righteous, and this is our hope. This is your hope, my hope. Oh, that the salvation of Israel will come out of Zion, when the Lord bringeth the captivity of the people. Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. Oh, friend, we ought to be looking forward to the rapture of the church. We ought to be looking forward to the second coming of Christ. We ought to be looking forward to seeing our Savior. Oh, that salvation of Israel were coming. Oh, that he would come today. Uh, we sing that, uh, Maranatha, even so come, Lord. So what is the hope? What is your hope? What is my hope? The return of Jesus Christ. We don't live in fear. We don't fear his coming. We have, don't have to fear his coming. We've been saved. We put our faith and trust in him. We've got nothing to fear. We're looking forward to reward, not revenge. We're looking for going home. Uh, to, we're going and meeting the one that died for us. Meeting the one that loved us while we were yet sinners. Meeting the one that forgave us when we didn't deserve forgiveness. Being the one that superintended over our life in times we didn't even see it, but he was there. Like a father, like a mother, tends over her children with hands that children don't see. <laughs> but there they are. There they are. We're like little children, and God is there. And so the hope of the righteous, our hope, your hope, my hope, is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the day shall come, and by his, uh, by his power, Israel would be restored. And uh, look what it says in verse uh, 7 there. Uh, when the Lord shall bring back the captivity of his people. That's, that's uh, taking, uh, taking away the burden, the captivity of sin. The captivity in this world. When the Lord comes, he's going to deliver us by his power. And we'll become his people. And by his power, the captivity ends. And because of his power, we shall rejoice as Jacob rejoiced. And because Jesus uh, uh, is going to come, Israel shall be glad and the church shall rejoice. And you and I will be rejoicing as well. 
Romans 11. For I would have not, have, not brethren, that you should be ignorant of this great mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away the ungodly from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them, and I shall take away their sins. And as concerning the gospel, they are for enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the election and the calling of God without repentance, for as ye in times past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so, these also now not have believed that through your mercy they may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded that them all in unbelief, that he might may have mercy upon us all. Upon all. God wants us to be Christians and witnesses and, uh, and uh, show God and let people know just what a great God we have. There's hope in Jesus. Amen. There's hope in Jesus. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you, Lord, for Psalm 14. Great Psalm. I pray we would read it on occasion and remember some of the things that we visited here and rejoice in it. It's a, it's a Psalm of great hope. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Lord God, I pray you'll bless us now. Give us power as we go this week. And I pray, Lord, we'll have a great week for your glory. Uh, help us to be the people you've called us to be in this sin-sick world. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.